Well, good morning. It's good to see you. Let me open us in a word of prayer and we'll start our equipping hour. Heavenly Father, we thank you for life, life on this earth. We thank you for the gift that it is. We thank you that you have numbered our days. Uh, You know the first and the last. You hold all in between. You are sovereign and you are good. Lord, I praise you for the gospel, for the good news of forgiveness of sin, that our time here on this earth will not be in vain if we are rightly related to you. We praise you for the opportunity to look at your word. May we be instructed by it this morning, shaped by it, uh, prepared and equipped for life by it, and for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. The topic for this morning is aging. That is our title in keeping with this series. All of these have a one word title, but this morning's message has a subtitle, Growing Old in the Grace of God. Uh, We're not particularly interested in the inevitable process that we are all in the middle of as much as we are interested in how do we do this well? How do we age well? That's the topic for this morning. I have not yet reached my 50th birthday, though my wife has reached hers, and she's not here quite yet to appreciate that comment. (laughs) I married up in just about every way conceivable. I'm not qualified to give this lecture. And it would be impolite for me to point out which of you in the audience this morning are qualified. In one sense, I would ask the question, who could rightly tell us how to grow old well? Because if you can hear my voice, you're still in that process. It's it's not done yet. You're not finished cooking, as it were. And if you have finished that process, you're not here to write about it. You're not here to tell us about it. And those of us who will face severe physical or cognitive decline in our twilight years will be unable to disciple others in how to face those things well. So there's a dilemma. I've been looking for the book that says how to age correctly. How to age for the glory of God. How to, how to get old and not lose your sanctification. How, how to grow in Christ when energy declines and physicality starts to fade. There are some good resources out there. I'll, I'll share some of those with you next week, Lord willing. But I didn't exactly find what I was looking for. And, and my hope is at this point in my life, at, at 49 years old, I'm, I'm hoping to do better than I have. And I'm, I'm looking for wisdom and how to do that well. I'm, I'm watching people. I'm following some of you. I, I'm taking principles from your lives. I've, I've interviewed many of you who are doing it well. Looking for insights in, into how to finish strong. How to grow in Christ when my brain is not what it used to be. That's the goal for this week, and and Lord willing, for next week, this will be a a two-part. And aging well is not about avoiding wrinkles, avoiding weight gain, or removing from ourselves all aches and pains. Though the physical decline is a very tangible picture of what it means to get old, That is not the highlight of what we'll talk about. Turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes 12. This is the depressing chapter that leads to the glorious end encouragement of the book of Ecclesiastes. It's worth a read, but the section I'll read to you this morning, the first eight verses, is the getting old is not for wimps portion of your Bible. It begins with this command, Ecclesiastes 12.1. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days happen and the years draw near in which you will say, I have no delight in them. And just stop right there. If you think I'm already past that threshold, how can I remember my creator in the days of my youth when they are behind me? The evil days have already come. 
Listen, I want all of us on either side of that line to listen closely to the twilight years described by Solomon. The sun and the light, the moon and the stars are darkened and clouds return after the rain. Just seems like everything's a bummer. In the day that the watchmen of the house tremble, the valiant men bend down, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few, and those who look through windows grow dark. It, this is sort of a mixed metaphor or a telescoping metaphor, a, a double picture of a great house that is the emblem of human physicality. And we have arms here and legs and teeth and eyes, lips that are all being described in really graphic manner. Those who look through windows grow dark. The, the eyes fail. The doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low. The grinding mill is the teeth and, and the lips just close and seldom open for a smile. Maybe some of those grinding stones are missing. Look at verse four. One will arise at the sound of the bird. You get older, you wake up easily. It's hard to sleep all through the night. All the daughters of song will sing softly. So a little bird can wake you up early in the morning, but you can hardly hear anything that's going on around you. Verse five, furthermore, men are afraid of high place and terrors on the road. You just shouldn't be hanging Christmas lights at a certain age or trimming your palm trees. The almond tree blossoms. The almond tree grows white in its tops. Uh, the picture there is of silvered hair. The grasshopper drags itself along. A really dramatic picture of the crippling effects of physical decline. It's just harder to get around. The caperberry is ineffective, is likely a, a reference to impotence. The man goes to his eternal home, but the mourners go about in the street. And, and all this just ends in a memorial service. People cry and then they go to Disneyland. <laughs> Look at verse 6, a graphic depiction of really a, a, a violent death. Remember your creator before the silver cord is snapped and the golden bowl is crushed. As the spinal cord and the, and the skull are probably described here. The pitcher by the spring is broken and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. All the mechanisms of life, the circulatory system, all of it just falls apart in, in one final crashing blow. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. That is where the graphic poetic summary of aging stops. Emptiness, futility, nothingness. Now, that, is, of course, is not where the sermon of Ecclesiastes stops. The goal of Ecclesiastes is to drive us to finding our joy and satisfaction and meaning in life, in God and in God alone, not at the things under the sun. But this depressing section ends with the end of life under the sun. And an under, under the sun perspective just drives us to despair. I spent time with a dear brother this week. He said, I feel a new ache that I have never felt before just about every day. Well, I'm, I'll make up an age, 937 years old. I don't want to give too much away here. And I need to trust the Lord with my age. In my mind, I'm 20. So what do I do next? I, maybe I should see a doctor. I want to watch the godly older guys that don't complain about their aches and pains. My mind tells me I can scale the eight-foot wall and drop to the other side, but my knees are telling me a different story. I was pretty athletic, and now I can't keep up with my three-year-old grandson. Listen, I want us this morning to embrace the advantages of getting older, even while we feel the tangible effects of inevitability. What are some of those advantages? Wisdom, experience, Growth and sanctification, godliness. Now, none of those are automatic advantages. Do you understand that? You don't get sanctified simply by growing older. You don't get wiser simply by growing older. We need to correct this just a little bit. Turn to the book of Proverbs 
Sometimes you've been around the block and you credit yourself with wisdom because of it. There's not necessarily an equal sign between your experiences and godly wisdom. Proverbs 22.6 is a, a famous verse when we think about child rearing. It says, train up a child according to his way. When he is old, he will not depart from it. I'm not convinced that that verse is a promise that if you read children's stories to your kids, they'll be Christians when they're old. I think the pattern there is you train somebody in a path, in a pattern, in a way of going, and that sets a trajectory for them that it's hard to get out of. This is proverbial wisdom. It's a truism. It's, it's not quite the same thing as a covenantal promise. Now, that's an encouragement to parents. Teach your kids the Bible. Uh, you, you create a pathway for them to walk in all of life. But the corollary to that is also true. You dig a rut for yourself in life and it's hard to get out of. You set patterns for yourself and, and you stay in those patterns. This is why the warnings in scripture about don't harden your heart. Don't stiff arm the word of God when it brings conviction to you. Don't put a callus over your heart. Don't sear your conscience. Why? Because the end of those roads is apostasy. You say just a little bit, I don't want God to touch my life in this little thing. At the end of that is God giving you over to God, not touching your life in everything. And the pattern of life is one of trajectories. If you can remember back to, to high school math, a trajectory is a, a dot with an arrow on it. It starts somewhere and it's going somewhere in a line. And, and you know that if a dot with two trajectories off of it that are different by one degree, in an hour at 60 miles an hour will be a mile off from each other. And just fast forward that into eternity. Old age does not guarantee better living, growth in wisdom, or growth in sanctification. Let me say this another way through the book of Job. Turn to Job 32 and verse 9. There we'll discover that age doesn't fix folly. Age doesn't fix folly. Job 32, 9. The abundant in years may not be wise, nor may elders understand justice. We don't think that's true when it applies to ourselves, but we look outside of ourselves and we know it's true. <laughs> there, there are a lot of old people who are not wise, who, who don't really understand life or, or how to tell others to live. But, but when it comes to ourselves, we tend to think I've been around the block some and I should be able to tell others how to live. Age doesn't fix folly. In fact, the pattern in the Proverbs is the naive one the one who doesn't really know anything and should be filling his mind with God's wisdom, eventually becomes the fool. And fool is not silly ignorance. The, the fool is the one who hates God and disregards God and rejects his word. And eventually the fool becomes the scoffer, untouchable in his unteachableness, headed for eternal destruction. So there's a danger at getting old and not growing in wisdom. Uh, there's a danger in sort of pigeonholing people. You can say, I've been there, I've done that, I've seen it before. There's no possibility of change. I've seen this kind of person. I know what they're like. I know what they do. And we fail to treat people as individuals. We can become the angry curmudgeon that's just impatient with youth. You know, the, the line you memorize is, get off my lawn. You, you just don't have a... a, a a joy to be around people. I, and I think that's rooted in an idolatry of identity. I think it's rooted in regrets over squandered opportunities and envy over those who still seem to have opportunity that I don't have anymore. And we become impatient with youth. Listen, we, it, just think about what it means as a church to train another generation of pastors. We talked about it last week in our TES Sunday. This church will continue to grow older and older and older. And the 25-year-old young man training for ministry 
will get younger and younger and younger. Still might be 25 years old next round. And, and we have to be ready to grapple with the reality that youth must be grown. They must be matured. And, and it takes the mature people who have been ahead of them to be patient with them to bring them along. And you may feel this, every year junior hires seem younger, college kids seem younger and younger, and it's a weird dynamic because in my mind, I think I'm still in college, (laughs) and and yet the maturity level seems to go down. That's just me. And we can be a curmudgeon about the state of our world, maybe the state of our country. If you're old enough to remember the good old days... You may remember an era where things were not like they are now. You're, you're feeling, experiencing a downward spiral, a downward slide in culture, in morality, in values. And if you're young, you, you're looking around and you're elbowing your parents right now and say, yeah, you say that all the time. And your parents elbowed their parents and their parents' parents elbowed their parents' parents over the same things. We can tend to think with reminiscence about the good old days and miss being present in the current day when those behind us need some help. If we only turn to angry curmudgeon status, we're not going to be a help. What can we offer the next generation if all we ever say is, well, when I was a kid, sorry, that I'm making fun of myself 40 years from now. That's all I'm doing right there. I appreciate patriotism and those who have laid down their lives for the freedoms that we have. It is a grief to me to watch this country that I love appear to go down the toilet bowl of Romans chapter 1 in a downward spiral of sin and being given over by God's judgment to more sin. It's sad to watch. But can I tell you that for you older patriots who have loved this country and wish we could get back to the whatever decade you think was the right one, A godless nation with peace and prosperity is no help to the church or the mission of the gospel to the ends of the earth. In fact, might be a hindrance. And what might be terrible for our country that I pray against and lament as I watch it happen may in fact be a benefit to the church. If we begin to look different from the world... Because we hold to biblical truth and eternal truths, not just American truths. That may be a benefit. There's probably a day coming when churches like ours lose tax-exempt status. I still, I can't believe we still have it, frankly. The government lets all of us benefit financially, incentivizes giving money to a narrow-minded, Bible-thumping, pulpiteering organization that wants to spread this narrow-mindedness all over the world, I can't believe Uncle Sam's still giving it to us. And a day is probably coming when that will go away. What will the church do? Do we live and die by our budgets, or do we live and die by our philosophy of ministry, our commitment to the gospel, and God's unshakable plan for the success of his church? That's where we'll be. And we might cry and say, oh, but the good old days. Well, what about the the good new days of opportunity right where we are, right where God has us for gospel proclamation? I would suggest to you that now might be the best time ever in our lives to stand up and clearly say there is truth and I know where to find it. When the world is saying there is no truth, there is no truth, nobody knows what's going on. What's wrong with our world? This is a great time to be a Christian. Even if it's not a great time to be an American. Listen, it's possible to get old and be unwilling to learn from anyone. 
Or it's possible to get old and be shy about what you've learned. You can be intimidated by youth and energy and and coolness. Listen, you're way cooler than they are. And they need you. If you're a seasoned saint growing in godliness, the generations behind you need you desperately. They may not know it. They may not seek you out. You may have to come up with convenient strategies to get them in your home, to get them in your backyard, to take them for a drive in your pickup truck, to show them stuff, to teach them stuff, to model Christ likeness. We need a good theology of grandparenting. Somebody needs to write that book before you're too too old to do it. Let's define aging just a little bit. Uh, I'll borrow from George Burns. You know you're getting old when you stop to tie your shoelaces and wonder what else you could do while you're down there. (laughs) And and if you've heard that there are hundreds of these, I'm not going to bore you. But you know you're old when you need your glasses to find your glasses. You know you're old when you've been there and done that, but you don't remember what it was. We just go on and on and on. Turn the corner just a little bit. You, you know you're getting old when, when it seems like you're just watching loved ones die all the time. Your, your friends cross the threshold. You're, you're alone in your family. Your, your siblings are going away. You've lost your parents. Maybe you've lost your children. It can be lonely, isolating. You know you're getting old when you're losing mobility. But let me give you maybe a philosophical, a mindset description of getting old. I think you're getting old when you begin to look backwards more than you look forwards. When your mind is filled with regrets rather than hopes. You're not thinking anymore about, oh, what can I do tomorrow? You're thinking about, oh, what I didn't do yesteryear. Or the glories of what I could do in yesteryear. Listen, it is absolutely unequivocal, inarguable truth that Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player ever to play the game. Amen. (laughs) And you know, there are a lot of basketball players in the world right now that can take him. He is a has-been. And I mean that in the most respectful way. The greatest in the world go through physical decline. They retire. And then sometimes they unretire and maybe demonstrate the need of retirement. And, and we can look back on achievements and, and locate our achievements and our possessions near our identity. And when you start to lose the physical appearance, When you begin to regret the things you didn't accumulate or you remorse over the things you did accumulate and you lost. When you have regrets about time wasted, opportunities squandered, and the if onlys. You know, in sixth grade, if that coach hadn't benched me, I'd be somebody today. If I hadn't been cheated by this or that, if these people hadn't mistreated me, I'd be... And and you're looking in the rear view mirror with sorrow and regret. It's the opposite of looking forward out the front windshield at hope and anticipation. What can I do? And maybe the, the getting older apex is defined by the difference in your exercise. Physical exercise, you're thinking, okay, if I wear these shoes and I lift these weights and I put this weight on my back and I climb camelback 17 times on a Saturday... I can jump 40 inches and I can dunk. And at some point your exercise says, man, if if I don't do these exercises, I'm going to break something when I go for a walk. That's the difference between what you're building towards in anticipation and hope and what you're trying to recover as it slowly fades away. You may think about that in terms of physicality, in terms of finances, savings under retirement. It is the looking back rather than looking forward. What I want to do as 
as all of us are aging, and, and if you're not reached your physical prime yet, you already are in a degenerative process. You must know that at the, at the basic biological level, you started falling apart the moment you were born. But the falling apart and the improvement meet somewhere in your physical prime. And, and maybe that's 19, 20, 21 years old. If you're not quite there, you can't tune out. And if you're past that, you may be hanging on the edge of your seat. I want to give us some things to aim at, some perspectives to maintain, and some helps along the way. Let's talk about some things to aim at. Number one, godliness. Turn to 2 Corinthians 3.18. The first thing we need to aim at as we age is godliness. In 2 Corinthians 3.18... We have a description of a process that God is at work in you. Look at this process. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord Jesus, are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. The first use of the word Lord is a reference to Jesus, into whose image we're being progressively conformed. The second use of the word Lord in this verse is a reference to the Holy Spirit, who's doing the work. God is doing something to you and in you through the power of the Holy Spirit, supernatural work. That is a process of growth and improvement from one layer of glory to another layer of glory. It's not finished in this life. Ultimate glorification is final redemption. That comes at the resurrection. But there is a work he is doing in you to make you more like Christ. And so a life yielded in faith to his process, dependent on the work of the Holy Spirit, is a life of progress, not regress. And it's a process that never ends in this life. So the physicality may decline. The mental acuity may decline. Mobility may decline. But what is on the rise? Christ-likeness if you are in Him. And to the degree that you are yielded to God by the power of His Spirit, through the instrumentality of His Word, through all the means that He provides for that. The local church, ordinances, trials, Your yieldedness in faith to God's processes will bring about growth, growth in godliness. Jonathan Edwards wrote some resolutions when he was a young man. Resolution number 28, he says this, I am resolved to study the scriptures so steadily, constantly, and frequently as that I may find and plainly perceive myself to grow in the knowledge of them. What does Jonathan Edwards resolve to do as a young man? Read my Bible every day. Grow in my knowledge of God every day so that I can see the progress. This is a reflection of what Paul said to Timothy. Let your progress be known. Let it be seen. Grow. Keep growing. Grow noticeably. Christian, are you growing noticeably in your knowledge of and love for and obedience to God? Is there visible, tangible growth in you? It doesn't matter what stage of life you're in. Can you say, I I know God better this year than I did last year. You can't answer that in the affirmative if you're neglecting your heart. If you're not putting your life under God's word. If you're not sitting under good teaching. If you're not around God's people. If you're not embracing trials the way God designs. You can stunt your growth. Here's another thing to aim at. Usefulness. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9. Paul says, We have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to God. Is that your ambition? To be pleasing to Him. To to be useful to Him. Whether you're home or absent from home. Whether you're in heaven with Him. Or whether you're here, is your goal the glory of God, being pleasing to Him, being a useful instrument in His hands in this world? Again, a few more Edwards resolutions. Number five, resolved never to lose one moment of time, but to improve it the most profitable way I possibly can. It's a good resolution. 
It's a resolution that can apply to every stage of life. God knows how much energy you have, how much mobility you have, how much mental acuity you have. What are you supposed to do with that as a stewardship before him? What Jonathan Edwards resolved was to never lose one moment of time, but to make it profitable. Resolution number six, he said, resolve to live with all my might while I do live. From, from the days in your physical prime to the days of your most sharp mental acuity combined with wisdom, whatever that apex is in your life, I've learned stuff and I've applied stuff and I'm as smart and as wise as I can be. And then the smartness starts to decline. Hopefully the wisdom continues. Whatever stage in life, to live with all my might while I do live. Resolution number seven, Edward said, never to do anything which I would be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. That's a good resolution. It takes us out of the rearview mirror of regrets and puts us right in the moment we're in. What do I have? What resources do I have? What tools at my disposal? How can I use those for eternity's sake and for the glory of God? Another thing to aim at is teachability as we age. They say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. The goal we ought to have is teachability. A disciple is a learner, a follower of Jesus. We will never exhaust the truths of his word in this lifetime. We, we should always be growing, always be a student. And you have to combine this teachability with a resolute faithfulness. Sometimes we mistake faithfulness and stubbornness. They're, they're two sides of a character coin. If somebody doesn't move, you go, man, that guy's faithful. Maybe, maybe he's just stubborn. There is a time and a place to not move, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. If you are a wet noodle when it comes to doctrine, that's a problem. If you are a pushover when it comes to the opinions of men, that is a problem. You be faithful and steadfast and immovable on the truth. But don't get into the trap of thinking because you know it, that is the truth. Be teachable. Be humble. Somebody opens God's word. Your grandkids open God's word and help you see something you never saw before. Yield to the truth of God's word. Don't assume that because you've been around the block, you know everything. First Peter 5, 5 addresses old men and young men and says, all of you clothe yourself with humility. So the humbly resolute is one who learns from mistakes, because if you don't do that, you're doomed to repeat them. You don't have to relearn everything. Hopefully, you've accumulated wisdom and knowledge to a place where you're not learning to tie your shoes again every day. You're not learning basic doctrine every day. You're not doubting the deity of Christ or what the gospel is over and over and over again every time some new doubter comes along. No, you're, you're rock solid and immovable on what you've learned. And yet, you're not set in your ways self-confident, trusting in your own experiences, eager to learn from everybody. That's a difficult tension to hold. Let me give you this morning some perspectives to maintain. Some perspectives to maintain. Perspective number one, contentment. Turn to Proverbs chapter 30. By contentment... I do not mean a laissez-faire attitude that just lets your physicality go. It doesn't matter. It matters. Well, my mental acuity doesn't matter. I don't need to be sharp anymore. No, it, it matters. There is a stewardship with who you are and the resources God has given you. You and I ought to do what we ought to do. Follow biblical commands, biblical principles related to who we are and what we have. But in the end... You have to trust the Lord with where he has you. Listen to Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9. Keep worthlessness and every false word far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. 
Feed me with the food that is my portion, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is Yahweh? Or lest I be impoverished and steal and profane the name of my God. These twin principles relate to finances pretty readily. We see that. I I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be poor. If I'm rich, I'll forget God. If I'm poor, I'll steal and dishonor him. Lord, just give me what I need. It's a prayer for daily bread, for sustenance. It's a prayer of faith and trust in God, knowing what I need. It's a great prayer. I think the principles here can be applied to health and physicality, just as well as possessions. If you think through this, Uh, make me neither a specimen or completely immobile. Lord, I just, I want to be pleasing to you. I, you know me, I I could sin against you in complaint or, or, or taking shortcuts or cheating things, or I could have everything I want physically and forget you. Oh, I don't want to do that. Do you, do you hear the, the heartbeat in the writer of the Proverbs? He, he knows his limitations. He knows his weaknesses and he's praying against them. Asking God for help in this. Listen, I'm convinced if we were in our physical primes and stayed there forever in this world, in this life, with these hearts, it would not be good for us. We wouldn't trust the Lord in the ways we need to. Turn to Psalm 139. Still talking about this perspective of contentment. Look at verse 16. In your book, all of them were written, the days that were formed for me. When as yet there was not one of them. God knows how many days you have on his earth. From beginning to end. He knows the one you're in right now. He knows the one you'll be in tomorrow. He knows when they stop. All of that is in his good hands. He is sovereign and he is good and he loves you believer. That helps us to not envy the young. You look around and you think. Man. She can run so fast and it's so easy. Look how high that guy can jump. Man, they don't even have to think about it. They just bend their knees. (laughs) Do Do you see that? Those of you who can't bend your knees without pain, laughed. I it's enviable. How how can they do that? Don't envy the young. Not only do the young lack the benefits of age, but they still have to endure the process. They will feel what you feel. You've already gotten through some of it. Maybe you've gotten through most of it. And they still have to endure. So don't envy them. The first perspective to maintain in aging is contentment. The second I have for you this morning is the principle of pressing forward. Pressing forward. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have every reason to look out the front windscreen. To set your heart there, to aim at things that are in front of you. Listen to Paul's perspective. Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Not that I've already attained the resurrection and perfection... But I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. So that Paul is going to press forward to something that's already guaranteed by Christ. Brothers, I do not consider myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Forget what lies behind. Run toward what's ahead. Do you know what lies behind, believer? You you may be tempted to look back with regret at sin, opportunities squandered, time wasted. Paul doesn't do that here. He presses forward. We understand Paul's past. Paul knew his own past. He, He lamented it, called himself the chief of sinners. 
And yet here, by God's grace, he is aiming forward. And no matter where you are at in life, this is a good biblical principle. There's a psychological phenomenon in our day we call the midlife crisis. And it is that period where stereotypically people are given to look back more than they're looking forward to see the downhill slide and try to recover some things. So the guy with the new haircut and the Porsche and and he's working out more than he ever has and he changes wives and he changes careers and he changes churches and he changes anything he can change because he's trying to get back something that he's lost and his life is filled with regrets. That is an unbiblical perspective, rank with idolatries, treasuring the wrong things, discontent with what God has. It produces a grass is greener on the other side type of approach that of course never works out. Always leads to more disappointments, more bitter than the ones that went ahead. Paul says you press forward. You look forward. And there's a lot to look forward to, Christian. Not only in the aging process, but in what it leads to. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Some more wisdom literature here for us from Solomon. This is the Bible verse cure to the good old days syndrome. Ecclesiastes 7.10. A prohibition from wisdom. Do not say, why is it that the former days were better than these? Looking at the past through rose-colored glasses. For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Do you hear it? We kind of got to take it off the table. There's another perspective to maintain. And it is faith. Stay right here in Ecclesiastes 7 and look at verse 13. See the work of God. For who is able to straighten what he has bent? You and I live in a broken universe bent out of shape on purpose. Why did God bend the universe out of shape? Again, read the book of Ecclesiastes, because if the universe was great and yielded everything that it used to do in the garden of Eden, and you were a sinner, you wouldn't look for the solution outside the earth. You'd be happy with the things here. Listen, God designed the earth to be a habitable place for joy and provision for humanity. The fall changed everything, and so God bent the universe. Things don't work the way they're supposed to. We have the second law of thermodynamics. Stuff breaks down. Things rust. They fall apart. There is decay, decomposition. God designed it that way. He programmed it that way, and who can straighten it? Who can unprogram it? And we try our hardest. Cosmetic surgeries, fountain of youth, vitamins, whatever we can get a hold of to reverse this thing. Simple faith just says, God, you're in charge. You bent the universe. How do I be a responsible steward with my physicality, my mental acuity? And how do I not bank on something permanent here? This isn't home. It's broken. Simple faith recognizes God's sovereign purpose in it. That leads to another perspective. Contentment, pressing forward, faith, but also a future. Turn to Romans 8. God will unbend the bent universe. Romans chapter 8 uses the word futility to take us back to Ecclesiastes. It's a very clear and sobering allusion to Solomon's wisdom work. Verse 20, the creation was subjected to futility. Your alarm bell should be going off. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 7.10 meaninglessness, vanity. Notice in verse 18, I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Whatever we're facing in our decline of physicality is not worthy to be put in the same sentence as the glorious physicality we will experience in a new heavens and new earth in new bodies. All of creation looks forward to it. Verse 19, for the anxious longing of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. The created order will be unbent, will live up to its design when humanity lives up to its design. Forgiven of sin, perfected forever, and glorified. 
That's all coming. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. That is, the creation didn't want to do this. The giraffes didn't want to do this. The aardvarks didn't want to be uh, slaves of corruption. But it was done by God. Looking forward in hope, Paul says, that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom that belongs to the glory of the children of God. That's coming. Verse 22, the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now, and we ourselves groan within ourselves. This faith in the sovereign goodness of God in a broken universe culminates in the reality, the realization, the fulfillment of faith in the future. We need another perspective. We need a perspective on our decline Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Every doctor's visit is one doctor's visit closer to home. I'll just read these words beginning in verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Momentary light afflictions work out for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Looking not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, the things which are not seen are eternal. We know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Indeed, in this we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. Indeed, while we were in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Because we don't want to be unclothed, but to be clothed. So that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now the one who prepared us for this very purpose is God. Who gave to us the spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage, knowing that while we're at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. We're of good courage, and we prefer rather to be absent from this body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. Have you grappled with your decline and the glory of it? Outer man's decaying. Inner man being renewed day by day. You are homeward bound. Every doctor's visit is one visit closer to home. There's another perspective we need. It is dependence. Look at 2 Corinthians 12. Aging brings about weaknesses. Weaknesses magnify strengths. Listen to Paul's words. He's been asking God to remove a particular trial. God's response to him in verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you. Power is perfected in weakness. Paul says, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, insults, distresses, persecutions, hardships for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. There's another perspective, a final perspective for us. It is the perspective of identity. Who are you? Is it your 401k, your bank accounts, your trophies, your achievements, your wins? Is it your relationships? Is it your physical appearance? Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Who are you really? Paul says, if you have been raised up with Christ, which is what is true of every single Christian, if you believe the gospel, surrendered your life to Christ, been born again, this is you, then keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you died. That seems jarring. I haven't died yet. I'm still here. I'm listening to a lecture about getting older. The reality is you died when you were born again. 
There was an old man that does not exist anymore. You are a new creature. Death has changed your relationship to sin and to law keeping and to God himself. Now, your life has been hidden with Christ in God. Who are you really? It's hidden with him. In verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, is manifested, then you also will be manifested with him in glory. Your identity is not bound up in your physical appearance, in the maintaining of it. Your identity is not bound up in the maintaining of your successes in your prime. Your identity is not bound up in the achievements that you used to have and now miss. Your identity is not bound up in the things you hoped to do but didn't accomplish. Your identity is Christ. Your life is Him, says Paul. And when He appears, you'll see who you really are. That is a paradigm shift for us. We need to have. Let me give us some helps along the way. How do I grow in my perspective of a a biblical theology of getting older? Of growing old in the grace of God. Not just getting closer to the grave, but doing it well. Let me suggest to you, older godly men and women, whom you never hear complain. It's not that there are some people who have aches and pains as they age and other people who don't. These things are a universal reality to varying degrees. But get around older godly saints who put to death complaining in their youth and walked in that wisdom or grew in that wisdom as they aged. People who embrace the wrinkles and the gray hair. Take lessons on enduring faith and contentment and joy from those who have walked long, faithful lives. And let me suggest to you that it's not always the oldest among us who have done this well. Talk to David Bauer Jr. and Randy Sidden about what it means to walk well in faith through physical difficulty. Read biographies. They all end the same way, right? I don't think we have a biography on Enoch (laughs) or Elijah, sort of. Everybody else's biography ends in the grave so far. So read good Christian biographies and, and watch how they lived and learn from their mistakes and learn from their successes, learn from their faith in affliction and trial. We need to read good biographies. And then read the Psalms. The Psalms are not tidy theological statements in the abstract. I know what I should believe. God is sovereign and I love it. That's where the Psalms end. But there's a turn because where they start is is a lament and a plea and a cry for help. God, why have you abandoned me? Why am I lonely? Why are the enemies encamped against me? And then there's a turn of faith in the Psalms. The Psalms give us access of a God-endorsed literature in song of suffering that turns in faith. Read the Psalms. Sing the Psalms. Let me give some help to the young. Ecclesiastes 12.1 is where we started this morning. Remember your creator In the days of your youth. Take in every word of that. Remember just doesn't mean. Oh yeah yeah yeah. There is a God somewhere. Remember him means to think about him. To order your life. And your thoughts and your affections under him. Remember your creator. This is personal. You're accountable. To the one who spoke you into existence. And sustains your existence. And you will meet him one day. So live life accordingly. And remember him in the days. These are, they're fleeting days. Solomon doesn't say, remember your creator in the long, drawn out, monotonous, boring days of your childhood. Although in your childhood, you have said, and your parents have heard it, I'm bored. It goes away so fast. What must you do? Orient your life towards 
God now. If you harden your heart now, you will not end up old and wise. You'll just end up old. Remember him in the days of your youth. There's a lesson there for you young people, for us young people, 49-year-old people and younger. That's the, that's the threshold. <clears throat> Don't give God the dregs. Don't think, oh, I'm going to live my life for me now, and I'll give God that holiness stuff later. It doesn't work that way. There's a reality in your Bible known as judicial hardening. That is, you choose to stiff-arm God, God may give you more rebellion. A downward cycle. It, there's, there's no guarantee that you're going to remember God when you're old if you choose to forget Him when you're young. If you're young, use your advantages and your strengths for eternal things. Listen, when your mind is pliable, you can learn things. You can remember things. You can take things in. You can memorize things. To my shame, there was a point in my life where I could get through, by memory, the entirety of the movie Princess Bride. That's dumb. What a waste of a pliable mind. I thought I'd always be able to memorize stuff. I can't. Not as well. It takes a lot more work now. And I'm still in the young category. What's it going to be like in December? <laughs> Use your pliable brain well and watch out what you take in. There's no delete button for the brain. When you're young, use that capacity for eternal things. Beware the dangers of your youth. Recognize the inherent weaknesses. Titus 2.8, 1 Peter 5.5 5 are both directed at young people. Be humble. Sit under your elders. Learn from them. Seek them out. When this equipping hour is done, young people, stand up, look around the room, find the silver hair, and go introduce yourself. Hey, I'm that young guy Smed was just talking to, and he told me I needed to come meet you and ask you, help me live for Christ. How did you do it? What did you learn? What mistakes did you make? What successes did you have? If you were in my shoes and could do it from my vantage point, what would you do? You young people, go find somebody to ask that question. Not just today, but often. Play to your strengths. Be wary of your weaknesses. If you're young, you need help in this. When we're old, we need help with this. I'll need your help to walk faithfully. Have you read your Bible and wondered, why, why did some of these characters not end well? Lots of people started okay. And ended poorly. There are some standouts that ended well and, and died in resolute faithfulness. Make that your aim. Make that your hope. It, it doesn't come automatically. You're in a war. A long, drawn out battle with your own heart and with the world and with the God of this world. But it is a very short war. It'll be over very soon. And it's worth it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for aging and decline. Thank you for the reality that mental acuity goes away, potency goes away, powerful abilities go away, physicality declines. That is all good. If we felt at home here, we would be way off. You bring these things into our lives to remind us of our need of you, to increase our dependence on you, to humble us. But I pray that it would stir in us a longing for our permanent residence. Would you make us homesick with every passing day? And would you make us faithful ambassadors that are eager to be reconcilers of sinful men to a holy God? May we make it our ambition at whatever stage in life we're in to be pleasing to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.